I'm project scientist for uh, the Perseverance Mars 2020 mission. Project scientist um, has uh, technically the, the job description says responsible for the scientific success of the mission. And uh, when I started a decade ago, I worked mostly with the engineers um, to uh, communicate with them what's, what the science needs were in the building of this spacecraft. And now that we're on, on Mars, I lead the science team. So we, have, we, are, uh, we are a very large group who have been working together for a long time. And we've been on Mars for 205 SOLs or, or Martian days. So that is just shy of seven months. This is a multi-year mission. So this is a very early stage uh, in this mission. And so much of what I'm gonna show you is um, by necessity uh, preliminary and, and uh, we've got a lot of work to, to go years ahead. Um, I wanna make the point that this is a, a really huge undertaking with a lot of scientists and engineers uh, working together for a very long time period. And I wanna acknowledge um, the huge efforts of so many people, especially during the pandemic. We, we launched uh, in July of last year uh, and it was a race to get the spacecraft finished as the world was sort of closing around us uh, in, in the spring. It's a remarkable team that got us to launch pad uh, and got us to Mars and is now um, successfully operating the rover. So, so big credit to lots and lots of people. And I must say, this is very different from anything I've done as a, as a scientist before. It is, it's really fun to work in a, in a team of a lot of people um, doing something really great together. What I want to do is, is start with the, the thing that everybody is sort of captivated by uh, initially, and that is the landing. Uh, landing a spacecraft on Mars is enormously challenging. Uh, the spacecraft has to uh, slow down from about four kilometers per second to a complete standstill uh, in just a matter of a few minutes. So it, it is, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, event. And this time, for the first time ever, there were cameras mounted in multiple places uh, on the spacecraft during entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. So I want to roll the, the video, which uh, assembles uh, the landing from the different vantage points that we had. And I'll start with this uh, orbital image, which shows the landing site. I'm going to tell you a lot about this uh, over the course of the evening. Uh, but what you're looking at here is uh, a delta. And I'll talk about how that forms if, you, if you're not familiar. For scale, this is about one kilometer across. And there are features that you will see in the video that I wanna point out. The first is the delta. You will see the cliffs of the delta. These are about a hundred feet high, 40 meters high. You will see uh, this crater that we call Hahutsa. And you will see this very strange um, region here it has a kind of a shape of a mitten uh, with, these, with these corrugations on it. This is a region called Sita. So you'll see these in the, in the entry, descent, and landing video, and you'll also see them um, as I go through what we saw from the ground. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver, where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate indicate shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. This is your first yeah, view of converged. the delta. Velocity solution, 3.3 .3 meters per second. Altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. 
That's the Delta and Hahutsa Crater and Sita right in the middle. continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. That's Ahutsa. That's Sita. Shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. We are starting this. So that was obviously a, a great moment, and uh, I just would point out the fact that uh, by the time we heard about it on the ground, uh, it had already happened uh, about nine minutes earlier. And so uh, the, the whole control room is, th there's nothing that anyone can do. The, the spacecraft is flying itself, and we learn about whatever happened nine minutes later. And I'll tell you, that is a very strange experience to be standing around waiting impatiently to get information on something that has happened quite a while ago. And, um, you know, that, that cheering at the end is, um, that is for real. That is people who have, have really, they put decades, uh, you know, com communally, the, the people in there have put in uh, many, many decades of effort to make these kind of things happen. So that was a spectacular start to what has been a very successful mission so far. Very happy about the way things are going. Um, I wanna show you uh, some of the things that we've learned uh, from the ground. Um, and I'll, I'll start with this. This shows um, where we landed. Again, this is that area, Sita, and you saw that we uh, diverted across it and landed in a very unexpected place. So that spacecraft had to decide where it was safe to land. You can't land on boulders, you can't land in a sand dune, you can't land in a crater. And so it had technology on board to avoid uh, those features. And, uh, and it just does it by itself. And it picked a place that was, as you will see, perfectly flat. But interestingly, it was very, very close to um, deadly terrain. This area here would be death from the sand dunes, or likely death. And this would be likely death from boulders. And when I show you the picture of this, um, you will understand why I say this would, this would have been a bad place to land. There are lots of boulders there. So we landed at this place here. Um, which we called Octavia Butler Landing after the author. And this is actually a, an orbital image showing the rover. So that's the rover. And these uh, light patches and kind of butterfly wings that you see there, um, that is where the descent engines, the thrusters, blew the dust off of the surface and, and exposed a lighter colored material. So let me tell you now about what the, the motivation for this mission is. Um, the major objective is uh, to seek evidence of life on Mars. And there's a really specific reason why I said it the way I did. We are looking for ancient life, not modern life and or extant life. And the reason for this is that we know very clearly that Mars today is too cold and too dry 
and has too much radiation on its surface for any life as we know it to exist anywhere on the surface of Mars. So there's, we could imagine other kinds of life that could live under those conditions, but there's nothing that we know about on Earth that could survive. But one of the fantastic discoveries of the last few decades has been that uh, you can tell that there is that there was a time period in the distant past when Mars was very different, when there were lakes and rivers on the surface of the planet. And we know this from the geologic record that we can see. And I showed you an image right at the beginning, and I said, this is the delta. A delta is, well, I'll talk about what a delta is, but it's produced by a river and a lake. And this, these decades of observations have led to the idea that while modern Mars is really cold and dry, that prior to about three and a half billion years ago, it was really, really different. Climate changed enormously right around three and a half billion years ago. And it isn't yet clear whether there was a northern ocean, which is shown in the artist's conception on the right. Um, but it is clear that there were large lakes, there were big um, rivers that made canyons. So it was a very, very different place uh, prior to this climatic event that happened about three and a half billion years ago. And one of the really great science questions that we are hoping to contribute uh, on, the, on the Mars 2020 science team is to answer the question, how it was ever possible for Mars to be warm enough to have liquid water on the surface. There are no uh, models that exist today that can explain how Mars could have been so warm. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's too far away from the sun. So it's a great question. It must have something to do with greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, at least that's what most people believe, um, but we just don't know. Good question we hope to answer. So at this time period, three and a half billion years ago, the surface of Mars was really different. It had lakes and rivers. And I told you we wanted to look for evidence of possible Martian life. And this tells you why we want to look in the distant past, why we want to look for ancient life, because then there were lakes and rivers. And life as we know it needs liquid water. And then you would ask yourself the question, what should we be looking for? What was life what, what kind of life should we be looking for? And we'll use the Earth as our example of one. We have exactly one example of what life looked like in the distant past, um, and that's Earth. And I should just point out that, that all of the planets in the solar system formed at exactly the same time, four and a half billion years ago. And so three and a half billion years ago, when we're uh, this lake that, that we are exploring in, in, on Mars, when that was present, it was only a billion years after the formation of the solar system. So we have gone and looked, many, many people have gone and looked to see what the uh, oldest evidence of life on Earth is like. And this is a picture showing the oldest evidence of life on Earth. This is a kind of a rock called a stromatolite. And there are very, very few places on Earth where rocks of this age, three and a half billion years are preserved. I mean, literally almost nowhere. This happens to be in a remote part of Western Australia. And what you're looking at is a rock with this that kind of crinkly bulbous structure that is so evident. That was produced by uh, a layer, a mat of microbes growing on the bottom of a shallow lake or sea. And this, this mat held the sediment together and uh, it caused it to be distorted and contorted in the way that you see there. And this is the, um, the the evidence in, in rocks of this age that life was present, not only was it present on Earth at that time, it appeared to be thriving, but it was only microbial. There was no advanced life at that time. Everything was microbial. So using Earth as, this, as the analog, the example of one, if we are looking at Mars three and a half billion years ago, we should expect to see that life had only advanced far enough to be microbial. I don't know how great an assumption that is, but what other assumption could you make? That's, that's just the simplest thing to assume. The place where we landed the Perseverance rover is uh, a location called Jezero Crater. And this is, shows a, a um, orbital image. So this is, a, this is not an artist's conception. This is a real um, set of uh, images taken from a spacecraft. And what you see in it here is the rim of the crater 
It's a 40 kilometer diameter crater. Uh, and this is about one kilometer high. And this is the delta that tells you that there was a lake here. So how does this work? Well, you can see here a sinuous canyon that cuts right through the crater rim. That's exactly what you think it is. That's a river canyon. It breached the crater. And this feature, the delta, is produced when the sediment that is being carried by the river is deposited because suddenly the fast flowing water of the river hits the slack water of the lake. And then the turbulence that suspends the sediment ceases and the sediment falls out. So this feature is a clear evidence um, that there was a lake here. And this lake is really interesting because it also has an outflow channel. And we can tell how deep the lake was because the lake would be, uh, the, le the level of the lake would be set exactly at the lowest point of the overflow channel. So from that, we established that this lake was at least 200 meters deep. This would be on Earth. You would consider this a very large lake. It's uh, about 30 miles across and uh, about 600 feet deep. That is, that's a really big lake. Um, so this is an artist's conception of what that, that might have looked like um, at this time, showing the, uh, this is now rotated from the previous view, but this is the in inflow channel, a lake that is quite full, and then the outflow channel. So you should be imagining that the rocks that we are looking at were deposited in this crater. Some of them are going to be associated with the period when the lake is here. And that is the, the most promising target for us to be investigating. So that's why we went to this place, looking for evidence of ancient life, here is a lake, and just to make the point clear, three and a half billion years ago, at the bottom of shallow lakes and seas, life was present on Earth. This is a shallow lake at the same time, and it is a very reasonable question to ask if there was life on Earth, why wouldn't there be life on Mars? It's not a crazy question. We don't have to invent uh, other kinds of life that would have existed under peculiar conditions. It's a very reasonable question to ask. So the other interesting feature that really attracted us to this site uh, is that delta. And that delta is interesting, not only from the point of view of it telling us there was a lake, but a delta is a fantastic habitable environment, a place where organisms could live. And it's also a fantastic place for organisms to be preserved after they die. So we say that this is a delta is a habitable environment with high preservation potential meaning that things that die, that there were microbes living as there are here in this image with all these colors that you see, uh, these living things get buried, but in a quite a gentle way by, by mud. And mud is a wonderful agent for preserving um, biological remains. If you, if you wanna go and look for fossils, uh, don't go and look in an in a, in a ancient, High, high speed river channel where, where all the fossil material would be just bashed up by all the moving rocks. Go to the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of the lake where the deposition is much more passive and, and gentle. So that is a great reason to, for us to have gone to uh, this Jezero crater because it has this delta with the high habitability and high preservation potential. All right, so you saw that we landed, we landed successfully. Uh, this is um, a, uh, a set of images that uh, we acquired within the first few tens of days after landing. This is a very, very complicated piece of hardware uh, with many mechanisms that have, after they have landed, they have had a, they've had a long and arduous journey. Uh, they, they launched through the Earth's atmosphere. They traveled through the vacuum of space. They did entry, descent, and landing. Uh, so the first thing we did is we checked everything out. And there were so many different things that needed to be checked out in a very specific order. Uh, we, we spent uh, tens of days um, doing things like wiggling the wheels, making sure that they were doing the right thing. Um, here we have the robotic arm with a, a set of instruments on it. And I'll tell you a little bit about more about the drill that's on here. So this is just checking, checking everything out. Meanwhile, we were also taking lots of images. And this is one of my favorite images if you look to see here, uh, look closely here, you will see that the tracks go to right here and then they stop. This is the fabulous evidence of the way we landed, uh, which you saw in that video. We gently put the rover down on the ground and then the, the uh, descent stage, which is the, which is the thing with the rockets on it, it flew away 
and left the rover just standing totally by itself. So literally the rover looks to have come from nowhere and just, it just appeared and started driving. And I just, that's very cool. One of the things that we did right at the beginning is test out new technologies. This, this is one of the uh, objectives of the mission uh, to uh, what they call enable the future. This is a NASA expression, enable the future by demonstrating capabilities that future explorers on Mars could use. And one of the capabilities that we carried with us is a helicopter. So you see this helicopter um, executing one of its first, in fact, I think this is its first flight. Uh, this is not a little tiny drone. Uh, the Mars atmosphere is so thin, 1% of the density of Earth's atmosphere at sea level, these blades need to be enormous. So the, the, the blades are almost three feet across and there are two counter-rotating blades. If you look closely, you can see both blades. Fantastic success. This, this helicopter was designed to fly six test flights. Uh, it just completed its uh, 13th flight and um, is, is going, going strong. So uh, it's, it's, been, it's been great. And we are now using this helicopter uh, to survey and to do reconnaissance in places the rover hasn't been to yet or possibly can't even get to. So this has been a really nice addition to the, um, to the spacecraft. What I'm gonna do is show you some of the information that we've obtained um, uh, in our exploration. And I should say that the, in addition to testing the, uh, enabling the future, these testing these new technologies, um, we have three main goals. The first is to explore the geology of the landing site. In other words, to look at the rocks and try to understand what they tell us about the ancient environment. What was, the, what was that lake like? Are all the rocks that are on the bottom of the lake, are all of them associated with the lake? Are there other things in there? And if so, how did those other things get there? And what do they tell us? That's the first thing. The second thing is to look for habitable environments, places where or microorganisms could live, and to actually look for the presence of biosignatures, things that might have been left by ancient organisms. So for example, we have the capability to look for organic matter. And organic matter is a, is a, it's not a unique indicator of life, but it is a strong, um, has the potential to be a, a, a compelling biosignature under certain circumstances. And then the final goal, and the one that is really the, the major objective of this mission, is the rover is going to collect about 35 samples of rock into individual sample tubes and hand them off to another mission which is coming uh, later this decade. And that, that uh, additional mission will bring the samples back to Earth to be investigated in terrestrial laboratories. And I'll tell you how all of that is actually going to work or how we think it is going to work. Um, uh, but the main point is that there are so many interesting things you can do with terrestrial laboratories on rocks that you bring back from Mars, including making definitive determinations of whether life was present in those rocks that you just can't do with a rover. So there's a very strong rationale to go about bringing samples um, back from Mars to Earth. And by the way, it is also a, um, a low risk way to test technologies that could someday bring humans back and forth to Mars. That's of course never been done before. Nothing has ever been launched off another planet and brought back to Earth. And so one low risk way to go about doing this is, is to bring back rock samples instead of humans in the, first, in the first attempt. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what we have done so far. And I wanna use this image to set the context. I'm gonna show you first uh, an image, a set of images from the Delta front. So, so remember I mentioned that these cliffs are about hundred feet high. And this is where the, the river was um, flowing out into the lake and the sediment was falling out. So I'm gonna show you a picture from the Delta front and from this little um, hill here, a kind of a, a butte um, called Kodiak. And, and what Kodiak is, is an erosional remnant. This feature used to extend much farther out than it does today and it has eroded away. So this is like a little island um, that was once part of this structure. We obtained images uh, of this area very shortly after landing and it was our first, wow, this is really interesting. Uh, so I'll show you those. 
And then I'm gonna show you um, information from our traverse from Octavia E. Butler Landing. I'm gonna show you some pictures from here. And I'm gonna show you pictures from where we are right now at this locality car called R2B Ridge. And remember, this is about one kilometer per scale. Okay, so this is the image of the Delta Front and of Kodiak. And I'm gonna start with Kodiak because this one is, it's just beautiful. This is my favorite image of the entire mission. It's just so, it's just a fantastic clear image. Uh, this, this feature is about 400 meters um, from the end and it is also about um, 40 meters high. And I hope you can see that there are a lot of layers in here. Some of them are flat, some of them are sloping. Uh, this was a really nice confirmation that the delta was produced uh, and what um, developed by migration so that the river was flowing out into the lake, depositing sediment, and then extending, the delta was extending outward, just exactly like you see where the Mississippi River flows out into the Gulf of Mexico. It's like that big bird foot um, is produced um, as, the, as the river continues to carry sediment driving the, the, um, the delta farther and farther out over the lake. So this was a really nice demonstration of that. This image, big surprise. This, we thought, would look just like this. And much of it does. But if you look closely at this feature right here, I hope you all can see my, my mouse. Um, this feature here um, is a lens of boulders. And this boulder here is more than a meter across, so more than three feet across. And there are lots of big boulders in here. This lens is telling us that at some stage that later in the, in the history of this lake, there was a very fast, fast flowing river, a river that can transport a boulder that is a meter across is very fast flowing. So essentially this is high velocity water flow. And if you think about it for a minute, if the Delta was produced um, where the, the river hits slack water, you can't sustain a high velocity water flow because it would be in the lake. Um, the only way you can explain this is that the lake level, after the deposition of much of the delta, the lake level was much lower and had essentially a flood roaring into it. So this was a completely unexpected observation that tells us that the, the fill history of this lake might be quite complicated. It might be that this lake was present and then disappeared and came back. Um, and that drives home the point that one of the things that's special uh, or different about Mars compared to Earth is that there is the potential, indeed the likelihood, that there are literally billions of years of geologic history superimposed on each other in an image like I'm showing you here. That's different from Earth because rocks on Earth get destroyed on a relatively short time scale by plate tectonics. So this is one of the challenges and one of the great um, potentials of Mars is that there's lots of information content, but it is all folded in on top of itself. And, the, and the, much of the work that we do is try to unfold it and, and, and put it back together. So we landed here at uh, the Butler Landing and uh, this is the traverse. Each white dot shows where we spent a night. The rover can't really do anything at night well, it can do a little bit at night, but it certainly can't drive because it is much too cold. Uh, it's about minus 90 degrees centigrade. In the daytime, it goes just about to the freezing point, but it is too cold at night to actually operate the road. So we've driven here um, about three kilometers. So I wanna show you um, the image from this box. I wanna show you where we collected two samples, S1 and S2, and then show you this area of our 2D ridge. This is the area right around the landing site. And I told you that the spacecraft, while it was doing entry, descent, and landing, figured out where it wanted to land. And you can easily see why that was, you know, this was the place. This is a good place to land. Um, these, these rocks are, you know, 10, 10 15 centimeters across, not, not, a, not a challenge. Um, these back here, these boulders are several meters across, and um, they go for, for miles and miles. This area is just chock-a-block with really big boulders. If we had landed there, game over. So we landed in a great spot and we have spent much of the uh, drive so far back 
it turns out that this entire route for about the first two kilometers, so all along here, looks basically like this. It is these, what we call the paver stones, sometimes we call them the whale backs, um, these little, little low rounded nubbins sticking out of the ground, and then in the background, these giant boulders. We got very interested in what these rocks are. One, the, the basic way that you, uh, remember I said that one of the goals was to uh, interpret the geologic setting here. Um, the way you do that is you look at the rocks with the cameras to see if there are features that tell you what they are. For example, is this a sandstone? Is it a, is it a lava flow? Uh, well, we drove along that entire length and we didn't see anything that told us what it was, what these rocks were, because they are coated with things. Obviously they're coated with sand and dust here. This discoloration that you see, the kind of yellowy color is dust. When there is no dust on the rocks, they're kind of gray. But it turns out even when they are not dusty, they are coated with other things. There's just, uh, we don't know exactly what it is, but, but it could be something that is analogous to like desert varnish. Makes it very hard to see into the rock and learn what it is. Um, nevertheless, we were very interested in um, uh, exploring what was inside of these rocks and also collecting the sand. And when we got to the locality at the end of that traverse called S1 that I showed you, uh, we decided that we were ready to actually uh, abrade away the surface of the rock and see what was beneath that coating that I mentioned. So we have a tool that goes in the drill, and I'm going to, you'll see a little video of how this uh, basically works in a minute, but um, it's, a, it's a disc with teeth on it. And we uh, deploy that onto the rock, and you see the um, uh, abrasion uh, patch uh, that we made by grinding into the rock. Uh, this is about three inches across. Uh, it was taken on a rock that looked kind of like this. So those are those paper stones that I mentioned here that are a little kind of rubbly looking, which turns out to be important for something I'm going to say in a minute. But when we pulled back and stuck the microscopic camera out over this patch. Oh boy, this is not what we expected. <laughs> this is another great moment. And one of the, one of the fun things about uh, uh, the, the NASA Mars missions is all of our images get put onto a website where you all can see them at the same minute we can. Uh, it's, it's basically hardwired, the, the, the pictures come in, they go to the internet and they go to our, you know, our, our consoles at the same time. When this image came back, we were very surprised. Uh, this, if you if you're, uh, have any geologic training, you will, you will almost certainly have seen rocks that look like this. Um, uh, these are crystals of um, uh, various minerals. This looks like uh, a lava flow. This looks like a basalt. And in fact, it looks like a basalt that cooled slowly enough to make big crystals. We did not expect, uh, we, we, most of us thought that this was going to be lake sediment. This is not lake sediment. This looks a, a lot like a lava flow. But it's more than that uh, because these holes that you see here and, and this brownish material and some of the whitish material, that's all alteration. So we have chemical data. We have a, a suite of instruments that identify both the minerals and the elements that are present here. And it's very clear that this uh, rock has interacted with water for a long time. It's basically rusting away. So the brownish material is iron oxide. Um, minerals are dissolving and making these holes. And the whitish material is salt. So it looks like there was a period when there was water here, rusting the rock away, weathering it away. And then there was a period when the water dried up and left salt behind. Very exciting. This is, yeah, on Earth, this would be a habitable environment. If you uh, look at in the groundwater table where there are rocks experiencing the same thing on Earth, they're filled with microbes. So we haven't seen anything yet, but this is early days. We did this uh, only about, I think about five weeks ago, and we're still working through the data. I told you that we are tasked with collecting um, a suite of uh, about 35 rock samples. And uh, now I want to tell you about that. Each of these 35 rock samples um, is about the size and shape of a piece of chalkboard chalk and weighs about 15 grams. And each one is drilled directly into an ultra clean sample tube. Ultra clean because we don't want to contaminate the samples with 
earth sourced, for example, organic matter. So the way this works is the sample tube is inserted into the drill, which is mounted here on the robotic arm. And I have a video that shows you how this, how this works. So that arm is two meters long and the turret on the end weighs 40 kilograms. It's a rotary percussive drill. So we collect the sample and then we ingest it back into the rover to process it in an incredibly sophisticated piece of robotic hardware. That yellow thing is the sample tube. So we move the sample tube through a series of stations to assess what's in it, take a picture and seal it. That's what's going on here. We're assessing the, the sample, making sure there's something in there. And then we stow the tube back in the place where we got it from in one of those little, they look like uh, little beehive chambers. So the tube goes back and gets stored in there And every one of those little little uh, holes is, a, is another sample to drive off. So that was the artist's conception of how this was going to work. Uh, this, this piece of hardware, this um, sampling system, is a really an exquisitely um, complex device. It's the most ex um, uh, sophisticated robotic device which has ever been flown. And just to make the point, this has to work in a dusty environment, there's lots of dust everywhere when you grind on a rock, it makes dust. Um, and it has to work without a technician um, going to fix it. And uh, there was a lot of thought, years of thought that went in how to, how to do all of this. Um, and so there was a lot of trepidation um, the first time we tried this um, in the end of, at the end of August. Um, what you see here is that same abrasion patch that I showed you a minute ago. And here is the um, the core hole. So you're looking at the, the mound of tailings around the hole. Here's a close up image of it. And the day we did this, we all knew it was going to be, it was a big event in the history of any of us. Um, unlike most of the time, most many of us went into JPL to be part of the, the big event. And we got this image. They, co they come in order. This image came um, early in the day, and everybody was. You know, super excited. This looks like it worked. We made a hole in the ground. And um, there were no indications of any faults. The, the, the robotic system is filled with error trapping. If anything goes wrong, it, it basically stops. And there was no indication that anything went wrong. And we were all at the point of cheering that, you know, yeah, we got our sample. It wasn't quite like EDL, but we were still pretty excited and ready to cheer when somebody said, well, wait a minute. There's nothing in the sample tube. So here you're looking down into the sample tube and you see the bottom and you see a few little specks of dust. I will say this was an incredibly deflating moment. Um, to have the robot, robotic system work apparently flawlessly with no sample in the tube. Um, it turns out what's happened here um, after we did a little bit of literally looking to see if the sample had fallen out on the ground. We, <laughs> we backed the rover up and took a picture below it, looking for the sample core. It was nowhere to be found. Um, what happened here is that this rock is so weathered that it's, it's friable. It basically falls apart into little bits of sand and dust. And then it falls out the bottom of the tube, such that the tube is empty. So this was uh, a, a no sample recovery. This is not a huge surprise. Um, rocks on Earth would do this too. It's a well-known thing. People that try to take cores of rocks, they fall apart. Uh, 
So what we decided to do is give up on this particular rock for now. We're going to likely come back to it. But for now, let's go find a rock that's harder. And uh, that's what we did next. We continued on this area. So we, that happened here. This first sampling was here. Then we drove along this feature called Artubi Ridge, totally different looking rocks. So I showed you the paver stones and the boulders of this area here. Then we got to Artubi Ridge, which if, you, if you're kind of geologically clued in, you will notice it's a little bit hard to see because of the rover track, but this is a weird straight line feature. Straight lines are strange. Um, they usually indicate, you know, something's going on that you should care about. We don't really know what this feature is, but the, what we have seen is really interesting. So this is this feature that we named our 2B Ridge. It's about um, from about two to four meters high. And unlike the area that we explored before, where I told you there was no indication that we were looking at sedimentary rocks, we didn't see any layers or anything like that that you would might see in sedimentary rocks. Um, what we can see in this ridge are clearly layered rocks. This is exciting to a geologist because this is how you learn what the rock is. For example, a granite doesn't have any layers in it. Um, a mud deposited on the bottom of the lake does. A lava flow also has layers. So we were really excited to see a different kind of a rock. And we decided that the best place to find a rock that was really hard um, was to go up on top of this ridge where all of these boulders that you see are being subjected to wind erosion. So wind picks up sand and abrades the rocks away. And all that's left is the most resistant rocks uh, in, the, in the pile. So we decided we were going to drive up onto this ridge and find a really resistant rock that would not fall apart when you tried to drill it. And by the way, also has high, high science interest. So it wasn't just a response to having um, failed to recover that first sample. So here's what we saw when we drove up onto that ridge. Um, another big surprise, this is, the, this is looking along the length of that ridge. Not only is it a straight line, but the layers, they're very clearly defined. We're actually up on the ridge here and they're tilted. And on earth, you wouldn't think twice, rocks are tilted all over the place. But that's because we have plate tectonics. On Mars, there is no plate tectonics. So why are these rocks tilted? We don't know. It's a great question why these rocks are tilted. So like I said, you got to accept this is early. Business. We're going to sort all of this out. Um, but we found in the, in the background here, you can see this kind of linear feature of rocks. This is a close up of that. Um, this is about um, maybe 10 meters uh, long. This looks like a layer of rock, which is falling into pieces. It's basically a jigsaw puzzle of what once was a uniform, uh, a con continuous um, layer of rock. And we decided to sample this um, briefcase size rock here. And I, I hope you get the idea that, you know, the first place we looked, uh, the rock kind of was low down in the ground and was all weathered and falling apart. This one, most of us that are geologists looked at it and said, yeah, if you hit that with a hammer, it would go ping. And so we were pretty excited to go and try to drill this rock. And we were successful. This was just uh, 10 days ago. Um, we did this. Uh, and this was the high five moment, and it was made all the more special having, having uh, been unsuccessful the first time. Um, here you see our abrasion patch, and here you see we took one sample here. Now we're looking in the, down the tube, and instead of seeing nothing but uh, brassy, bare interior, we have this beautiful rock sample. Oh, and up here, this is the, this is the coring bit. Um, I mentioned before, this is a rotary percussion drill bit. It's just like a hammer drill that you buy at the hardware store for you know, drilling into cement. Um, but the tube, the sample tube is inside it. So we core directly um, into the tube. The sample that we got um, is, is beautiful. Um, very exciting as a, as a potential rock to bring back to earth. It also looks like a lava flow. It's got the characteristic minerals of a lava flow. But like our first rock, it's, you can clearly see the reddish discoloration. This rock is rusting. Um, it also has salts in it. So this rock has lots of um, history to it, uh, first as a lava flow, and then as a rock that was probably sitting in groundwater for a long time. And um, so this rock was successfully uh, cored, sealed, and stowed in the rover. And we took a second sample for reasons I, I can get into if you're interested in the, in the question period, but we took a second 
a second copy uh, of this rock. So these are our first successful um, uh, sampling attempts on Mars. And so we like to say we have now started the, the Mars sample return effort. Um, and let me uh, then just um, say a couple of words about uh, what the deal is here with um, Mars sample return. Um, the Mars 2020 mission is not capable of bringing these samples back to Earth. Instead, Mars 2020 is the first in a notional three mission campaign to bring samples back. And this, this may seem very strange, so I wanna, I wanna work through why, why it's being done this way. So the basic idea is you start with a very capable rover, and I emphasize it because it needs to rove. And we have a plan, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, to rove tens of kilometers collecting samples, very different than any other rover mission that has been on Mars, so to go in planning to rove tens of kilometers. Um, we also have very sophisticated instruments to help us pick the right samples. So that is our job on Mars 2020, collect the samples into those tubes. And then we hand the samples off to a follow-on mission. And right now, there's a, the plan is for a pair of follow-on missions that are being jointly uh, developed by NASA and the European Space Agency. Uh, the two missions are a um, Mars ascent vehicle, basically a rocket that lands on the surface and potentially also a fetch rover, a small rover that can go and pick up the samples that Mars 2020 collected. So I, when last we talked about the samples, they were inside the belly of the rover. At some point, the mission will Put the samples down on the surface to be picked up by a future mission. This is many people are puzzled. Why would you ever take you know put them out of your possession? Well, there's a really good reason. If the Perseverance rover gets stuck in the sand or, or dies with the cargo on board, then there's no way to get it back out. So what we do is a very simple um, uh, idea we put down what we call a cache or a depot. We take our collection of samples and we set them down on the ground in one place uh, that then are a target to be picked up by this fetch rover. And then it doesn't matter. If Mars 2020 is, is functional, it can go off and collect more samples and bring them to the depot. If it's not functional, it doesn't matter. The samples are on the ground and they are a target for this, this future fetch rover. In any case, fetch rover picks up the samples, puts them in a, a um, soccer ball sized container we call the orbiting sample, which is in those cone of this rocket, fires it uh, into space where you have this now in orbit orbiting sample. And in what strikes me as being a remarkable thing, apparently one can capture something the size of a soccer ball um, orbiting around a planet. So there's a, um, an orbiter that captures it and brings it back to Earth. So this is the plan um, that uh, NASA and ESA are working on right now. Lots of very complicated details that need to get worked out. Um, but this is coming towards the end of this decade. And if all goes in according to plan, samples will be returned to Earth um, in the early 2030s, possibly as early as 2031. These samples are um, going to be really interesting in that not only do they record lots of information about the history of an Earth-like planet, a rocky planet, um, from a very distant time period, the rocks all around the landing site we think are in the vicinity of between four and, and maybe three and a half billion years. On Earth, you will find almost no rock of that age for the reason that I mentioned earlier. But we will bring back from Mars lots of rocks um, from that time period. So that'll be really interesting. But even more interesting is for the first time, the scientists of the future will have to grapple with the question, how do you look for life that may be different from our own? What, what techniques would you use? Nobody has ever had to do that before because nobody has ever had a sample that might have had life different from our own in it. So I think that's going to be really exciting. I think there's going to be a really interesting convergence between uh, what I would broadly call geoscience, people that, that do geochemistry and geology and study rocks, and um, uh, astrobiology. And uh, so that, I'm looking forward to that, to that happening um, in, in the 2030s. And then my final slide, I just wanted to show you what we are thinking that we will likely do. Of course, 
you know, it is a, it's a voyage of discovery at some level. We're not really sure exactly what we are going to do. But we landed here and we knew that we could not get across this feature called sea tuts. It, the sand dunes are just too big. You don't want to land there. You don't want to drive there. It's just a no-go zone. And interestingly, our major target initially was to go to the Delta because that's the place where, we, as I mentioned earlier, that's the place that seemed very habitable with high preservation potential. Unfortunately, we have this big block of sand dunes in the way. So there were two ways we could get around it. We could go uh, clockwise or we could go counterclockwise. Uh, I think very likely we will go around this way. It turns out this drive is, is very treacherous through, through sand dunes and very slow. And one of the neat capabilities that Perseverance has is a, is a very sophisticated um, artificial intelligence capability to do long distance driving and keep itself out of sand dunes and, and related hazards. So I think we're gonna drive really quickly around this way, go to the Delta. This will take about the first year of the mission. The second year of the mission is likely to be up um, studying the Delta. And then the final year of the, of the prime mission um, will be in this area here um, where there are possible places and rims. And then ultimately, if the mission has an ex extended life, there's a decision that is you know, up to the up to the how well the rover behaves and also whether NASA continues to support us, um, we will drive up the crater rim and explore a completely different environment um, up in this area. Uh, so that, that's what I want to present. I'm uh, very happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you, Ken, so much. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started. I already see some questions in the Q&A and feel free, all of our attendees, feel free to go down to the bottom and press on that Q&A button and you can put all of your questions in there. Uh, so I think I'll just start. Uh, with the first one here, it says, do you feel you can find and confirm life on Mars without having humans physically present? Uh, well, I, I think the way the question was intended was meaning, meaning astronauts on Mars. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that that is necessary, but I think it is necessary to have a human with a sample and likely on Earth. Uh, the, the, one of the interesting things that you should think about is if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, you probably are not going to bring the right tools to make the observations. If you bring the sample back to Earth, you can use every single laboratory that exists on Earth to measure anything you want. And so this, this is a kind of a major limitation on a spacecraft. It only measures the things you, 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 know, you, you brought with you in your toolkit. So I think humans are necessary, but it's likely to happen on Earth. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I think that's what, you, what he meant as well. Um, Another question here says, how do you know the timing of when Mars climate changed? You said three and a half billion years ago. What is the evidence of that timing? How certain are you of that? Any idea of what happened to cause the change? That's a great question. And it is one that we hope to uh, address pretty directly. Um, the way one tells time uh, in, in bodies um, off of the earth is very different than the way we tell time on earth. Uh, the, all we can do in, in, in the solar system is to count craters. So craters are, uh, they're not produced at a constant rate, but they are produced at a rate that is reasonably modeled. So more craters means older, fewer craters means younger. And this is calibrated um, by the samples that came back from the moon, uh, which were dated using radioactive decay methods. This is how we date rocks on Earth. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very sophisticated, um, high precision, high accuracy way to do things. So the crater counting on Mars suggests that the climate changed at three and a half billion years ago. And that has an uncertainty that is probably half a billion years on it. Um, when the samples come back, uh, I think we will be able to nail down uh, the ages when water was present. We will probably be able to get uncertainties of a few million years at, at three and a half billion. So we'll drive it down to, to percent, percent level uncertainty, which will be spectacular. Um, so we don't know why, we don't know when that, when that happened, but it was clearly a long time ago. And the leading explanation for why it happened is that um, Mars has, currently, it has no magnetic field. Uh, there's evidence that it might have had a magnetic field early in its history. And if that's correct, then one explanation for why the atmosphere disappeared, you need to have an atmosphere in order to have um, 
you, to have it warm enough, as I described, uh, is that the, the magnetic field protects a planet from interaction with um, uh, charged particles from the sun. And those charged particles can actually erode the atmosphere away. And so one leading explanation is that the atmosphere of Mars was eroded away when the magnetic field disappeared. Very interesting. Yeah, that definitely, hopefully you can figure out more once, uh, once you get the data back. Um, another question here says, how is the sampling working? Is it consistently reliable? And if any of the rover or helicopter technology fails or stops working, is there a way to remotely repair it from Earth? Well, so far the sampling system, in fact, everything on the rover is working extremely well. We've had um, faults um, and, and essentially the way you, the way you design um, a sophisticated piece of hardware like this is you just have it stop. When anything that doesn't look right happens, you stop. And there are lots of things that we call nuisance faults there. You know, when something happens, that's no big deal, but the rover thought, hey, this doesn't feel right. I'm not gonna do it. Um, and that's because there's almost nothing you can do. Uh, there was a, um, I, I can give one example where I know that um, a repair job has been done. The Curiosity rover, which is a kind of a twin of the Perseverance rover, it had a problem with its drilling system and uh, it, it essentially stopped working the way it was designed to. And the, and the engineers um, spent about a year on Earth essentially reprogramming the thing to use it in a completely different way. And, and to continue forward. But there's really no, there's no, no simple way to fix anything uh, on Mars. And so you just have to design against failure. Very interesting, yeah. <clears throat> All right, another question here says, the video of the drilling with sound, would you hear that sound on Mars, low density atmosphere, or is that just to enhance the production value of the video? Well, I, so I can give you the real answer. Um, for the first time, uh, there, there are microphones on Mars, two microphones. Um, we have heard sounds. I didn't play them because they are very hard to hear. Um, they're not very loud for, for the reason that the, the, the person who asked the question um, noted. It's a very low density atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. And, but you can definitely hear sounds. You can hear the sounds of the wheels clanking along um, over the rocks. Um, we have not yet recorded the sound of the drilling, but I bet it makes a lot of noise. It, it uh, almost certainly does. And what's interesting, and I, and I think maybe there's some intuition here that people will have, um, the atmosphere of Mars is made out of carbon dioxide. So not only is it attenuated, meaning it's not as loud, but it's frequency shifted in much the same way that you know, we kind of jokingly, if you inhale helium and talk, you have the high squeaky voice. Um, that's because the, the way sound um, propagates depends on what gas it is. So um, we have recorded sounds, we've recorded wind, we've recorded the, the sound of pumps in the rover. And if you go to the Mars 2020 website, those recordings are posted. And uh, we, we will continue to record different sounds. Um, and just, in, just to make a point that we have not yet recorded the sound of drilling because we haven't yet uh, convinced ourselves that there is no interference from using the microphone while you are drilling. And you might think that's strange, like how could using a microphone possibly affect the drilling? And I would probably agree with you, it probably doesn't. But you don't risk the spacecraft saying, well, I don't think it'll matter. So you just don't do it until you prove that there is no risk. And so one of the things we have to do before we start recording the sounds of the, of the drilling is to make sure that it's safe and it's not gonna interfere with anything and cause us more problems. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Don't wanna risk anything of that nature. Um, another question here says, do you have any instruments on board that would allow you to perform basic analysis of the samples? Yeah, good, good question. Um, we made a decision in the development stage that we would not touch the samples with our science instruments on board the rover. We don't want to contaminate them. We don't want to modify them. And, and most kinds of techniques um, would do one or the other, uh, if not both. And instead, we adopted that strategy, which I, um, I didn't, I didn't uh, close the loop on there. We abrade the sample and expose a surface. We do our geochemistry on that surface. And then we collect right next to it a pristine sample. Mm. And in that abraded patch, we have the ability to determine what elements are present. We can determine um, what minerals are present. And we can look for organic matter. 
And we've only done that, we only have the two abrasions so far, and that this is what allowed us to say these look like lava flows um, and that there are salts um, in there. Um, but beyond that, we haven't even yet um, processed the data we got in the last few weeks to really understand what all we've got. That makes sense. Don't want to contaminate it. So you take two different samples. That's awesome. Um, another person here just says, please repeat why there are no three to four billion year old rocks on Earth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so the Earth and Mars formed four and a half billion years ago. Undoubtedly, rocks were present on, on the Earth at that time. But over relatively short periods, hundreds of millions of years, there's plate tectonics that destroys rocks. So what that means is that uh, rocks get subducted, um, they get covered, they get metamorphosed. So the Earth is a very, very active, geologically active planet um, that has, that has uh, destroyed rocks over its entire history. Um, whereas Mars does not have plate tectonics. And so the rocks that were present at you know, three and a half billion years ago, are still there. Great. Um... Got another question here. It says, I believe you, you've mentioned this, but maybe you can expand on it. It says, what speculative hypotheses may there be regarding how it, it was that Mars had liquid water? Yeah, I think the question is, how is it ever warm enough for there yeah. to be liquid water? Mm -hmm. And um, the, there are really two, two classes of ways to, to do it. One is to say it was transient, that the water was present for only a short period of time in which case it's possible that you could have water after say a comet struck Mars. And, and you might think, well, that's a very low probability event, but uh, you know, you've got billions of years to, to do it in. So even if it's low probability, it still can happen. So if a comet comes in, it delivers water to the planet um, and you have a transient dense atmosphere that, that warms up through greenhouse warming, um, and yet it's literally just a, a transient event might last a few tens of years and do all of that um, ge geology that I mentioned where you have the you know, formation of canyons and you have formation of deltas. Um, the other possibility is that the, the atmosphere was, was maintained in some longer, for some longer duration um, with a composition that allowed uh, substantial greenhouse warming. And so much of the work right now that is being done in, the, in modeling is to try to understand what greenhouse gases are available in the Martian atmosphere um, that wouldn't react away. You can't just put any gas in the atmosphere. If it reacts with the rocks, for example, it disappears. Um, and so those are, those are the two ways that one could imagine it working. And one of the things that we are really interested in exploring uh, in Jezero Crater is any evidence we can get for how long the water was present. The, the kind of comet model that I mentioned a few tens of years, uh, it is almost impossible to imagine that the weathering that we saw in that rock, that rust, the salt, it's almost impossible to imagine that that could be produced in a few tens of years. That looks like a much more extended period, but um, you know, we, need to, we need to work further on that, see if we can add any additional constraints on it. Very interesting. Um... Another question says here, do you think we'll learn about Earth's history from older rocks that we find from Mars? If so, what can we learn? Yeah, good question. Um, this is one of the motivations. In, in, the, um, in the way that we talk about sample return, much of the focus is on looking for evidence of ancient life. And that is a, um, that's a great goal, but it also has the potential that we will find nothing. In other words, we could, we could look at these rocks when they come back to Earth, and we could say, no, no evidence of life there. Um, and that might be considered a disappointing result. Um, but all the samples can be studied for many, many different important questions. And, and this is one of them. What were rocky planets like early in their history? Mm -hmm. And as an example, it is almost certainly true that both Earth and Mars were once entirely molten, um, in what we call a magma ocean phase, um, during uh, planetary accretion. So four and a half billion years ago when the planets were growing, uh, the, the gravitational attraction of all of the bits of the solar nebula that made the planets, all that gravitational energy uh, caused the planets to melt. Um, and uh, the record of that on Earth is completely gone. There's no evidence for that because those rocks have completely disappeared and 
but on Mars, there's the potential that some of those rocks are still present. And uh, we'd very much like to know how that process works. So that is an example of how we will learn about Earth. The other is, um, going back to the life question, uh, I think in the handful of truly profound scientific questions is the question of the origin of life. Mm -hmm. And there is really no consensus in what environment life originated. And we will never know on Earth, in my opinion, we will never know where life originated on Earth because there is no rock record from that time period. The oldest rocks that, that, um, that have been studied show evidence of life in them on Earth. Um, therefore, we are not going to be able to find rocks that predate life in this, in this kind of prebiotic environment. So if we want to understand the environment in which, in which life originates, we're not going to be able to do it on Earth. Now, Mars is, of course, a different place, um, but if, if there, is a, um, there is the potential that we can see these um, prebiotic environments, what was the surface of the planet like um, during the time when life was originating? Wow. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. We have a, another question here. It says, did you say there is currently no tectonic activity in Mars? Do we know if there ever was tectonic activity? And if so, roughly how long ago do researchers think it stopped or subsided dramatically? So the, the InSight mission, which is a lander that landed on Mars a few years ago, um, has a seismometer and it is recording um, a small number of earthquakes. Uh, indicating that there is some activity inside of Mars. And there are also volcanoes that, uh, that we believe are still active at a very low level. So Mars is not entirely dead, but the, the feature of plate tectonics that really matters um, is that the, the surface of the planet is, is constantly being uh, pushed and pulled around, um, you know, making, making the volcanoes of the Western United States and, you know, th this is the, the really dramatic thing. Um, and it is that process, that process of plate tectonics um, occurs because heat that is inside the Earth's interior is getting out. So it's basically convecting in much the way that if you put a pot on the stove and heat it from the bottom, the water bubbles up to the, you know, um, circulates up to the surface. That's exactly what's going on on Earth. Um, Mars has cooled off as a smaller body. It has cooled off. It doesn't have enough energy uh, to drive that anymore. And there's no evidence of Earth-like plate tectonics. There are other ways that heat can get out of a planet beside plate tectonics. And on Mars, uh, one of the clear ways that, that heat has gotten out of the interior um, is this enormous volcano called Olympus Mons. It's the, the biggest volcano in the solar system. Um, so it, there are processes that have occurred but basically the planet has cooled off too much to drive a lot of um, activity. That makes, so the cold weather is what leads to it then. Um, another question here says, what is the helicopter doing? The helicopter had as its, its goal um, was to do a set of six test flights. It aced the six test flights, uh, made it look super easy. And uh, the decision was made by NASA to extend the helicopter um, to not, not just demonstrate that that controlled helicopter flight was possible on Mars, uh, but to um, do what we call an operational demonstration to show how you would actually use it. And so the science team is in, involved with the helicopter team and we're using it for reconnaissance. Um, we send it out ahead of the rover to look for places that are safe to drive and to look for interesting outcrops where we can um, send the rover. That that's a, seems like a very useful tool then, that's awesome. Um, another question here says, is it theoretically possible to retrieve the entire rover from the surface rather than a soccer ball sized item in space? Uh, it is definitely uh, theoretically possible. And um, just to sort of put this in context, um, the uh, few kilograms of that soccer ball uh, is, it is a, it's a big ask. The, the missions that are being built uh, to follow Mars 2020 they have to invent a lot of new stuff, including the rocket. Um, but ultimately, if humans are to go to Mars, or at least if they're to come back, um, we have to be able to lift things that weigh a ton, literally a ton. The, the Perseverance rover weighs almost exactly a ton. Um, that will be small compared to the amount of mass that we need to come back with uh, astronauts on board. So there are definitely a lot of thinking about that, but that technology is, is still in the future. Makes sense, makes sense. 
Uh, another question here says, what are the limitations on determining the composition of adjacent geologic uh, samples by spectroscopic, spectroscopic equipment? Sorry, not quite familiar with some of this language. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure I understand exactly what the question is, but we do have um, uh, a variety of different techniques that are, that are spectroscopic and uh, meaning that we use photons, we use light. Um, and uh, I, I think maybe this question might be getting at is when you um, uh, take an image, uh, a, a certain region, a piece of rock um, sends its photons to the camera and the, you, you get a mixture of the different minerals that are present um, in, in indicated in the photons that come back. Essentially the same thing your eyes tell you from different colors that you can see the different minerals are present. Um, we, you know, we're sorting through that. That is, a, that's a challenge, but we are, you know, we're able to use the um, you know, techniques to separate out the different constituents that are present. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, another question here says, does the rover have special equipment to free itself if it gets stuck or even if it were to get turned over? Oh boy. Do not turn the rover over. <laughs> Rule number one, don't turn the rover over. Um, there's nothing that um, we could do in in you know sort of catastrophic event like that, and and so you just stay away from places where you might have trouble like that. So we stay away from steep slopes, and we are very very careful never to put all six wheels in the sand. And there are a lot of testing has been done uh, with the the Perseverance rover and its twin, the Curiosity rover, that show that if, as long as you keep several of the wheels on rock, you can get yourself out. Um, but uh, this is a this is the way that uh, an earlier rover, um, the Spirit rover, was lost, it, it, not in sand but in, in dust. Uh, so one is very very careful about driving in sand. Wow! Don't turn over the rover. That's funny. I like that. Um, Nobody's ever asked me that before, but I'm, I'll, I'll pass that on to the engineers. Please do not turn the rover over. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, Question here says, would you expect the relative abundance of elements and their isotopes in, in the Mars samples to be similar to that on Earth? Really good question. Um, because it allows me to, to, to uh, this, is, this is what I do. This is my, 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 my personal science. Um, and uh, essentially everything in the solar system uh, was built from the same building blocks. All of the planets um, were built from the same building blocks. And what that means is they, they will have the same elemental abundances and to a very good approximation, uh, the same isotopic composition, except for those elements which are modified by major processes. And let me give you the one example, which is really compelling here. Um, we know from the analysis of meteorites that have come back from Mars, and so meteorites are, are uh, knocked off of the surface of Mars and some of them come to the Earth, and also from the Curiosity rover, that the water that is presently on Mars is very, very enriched in the heavy isotope of hydrogen. And this is a strong indication that something happened to, to allow some of the hydrogen, the light isotope of hydrogen in preference to escape. And so that is one of the pieces of evidence of this atmospheric loss is uh, water that was present was um, separated so that the, the light hydrogen went off into space and left the hydrogen that is left behind, the deuterium, the heavy isotope of hydrogen, highly enriched. So there's a, there's a lot of really interesting science that one can do by looking at um, subtle variations in isotopic composition. Very interesting. Um, another question here says, what is the estimated lifespan of the rover? Prior rovers have outlasted their initial predicted lives many fold. This is a nuclear powered rover. There is a, uh, uh, a block of plutonium that supplies thermal energy, which both heats the rover and provides electricity. And it is expected to last um, tens of years uh, before the um, radioactive isotope uh, dissipates. However, the, the system is likely to stop producing enough energy to drive the rover um, in something like 15 years. Um, the, the Curiosity rover, the twin, still going strong. It landed in 2012, so it's been on the surface for a decade. Um, so it, it's likely that uh, 
speaking optimistically, it is likely that we will continue for that kind of time period. That's great. Lots to do on the surface of Mars. Um, another question here says, how do you ensure that there is no cross-contamination of Mars environment by microbes from Earth? Yeah, okay. Another great question. Uh, it's important um, from a scientific perspective for Mars to stay pristine. If we want to understand what Martian life could be like. Now it's, it's so I, I, I told you the story that this, the surface is not conducive to life as we know it. And if you listen carefully, you would see every time I said that, I said the surface, um, there could well be life of the type that we know below the surface. For example, in a groundwater table uh, that is sufficiently deep where it, you know, it's warm in the interior of the planet. Um, one of the things that uh, the scientific community decades ago when Viking flew in the, in the 1970s, the scientific community said, we cannot contaminate Mars if we ever want to find anything other than our own life on that planet. And this led to, to the concept called planetary protection, um, which means that all spacecraft that go to Mars uh, are um, sterilized is a strong word, but they are cleaned to a very considerable extent such that the probability of any Earth life arriving intact and living on the surface of Mars is acceptably low. Um, in the old days, this was relatively straightforward. In the Viking days in the 1970s, they, they took the entire spacecraft and they put it in an oven and they heated it to 300 degrees. Um, can't do that today because so many things are made out of plastic. Um, plastic does not like being at 300 degrees. Um, and so we used a combination of heating things that could be heated and then wiping off surfaces with things like hydrogen peroxide. Um, so a lot of effort was made to keep the spacecraft clean. Wow, never even thought of that. That's pretty wild. Um, another question here says, what are, the what, what are the typical temperature and wind conditions on Mars? Well, typical and is, you know, just like on Earth, it varies all over the place. Um, but where we are in the season we're in right now, which is uh, the summer season, um, as I said, it gets up to around the freezing point during the day and it cools down to um, about 90 degrees below zero centigrade um, in the nighttime. And that is a gigantic uh, temperature fluctuation. This is actually, interestingly, it's one of the things that causes the greatest stress on the, on the spacecraft, on the rover, is just the thermal oscillation. The things expand and contract and expand and contract day in, day out, day in, day out. And, and this, this ultimately is, is, a, is a failure mode for, for parts. They, um, they just weaken from, from the thermal stresses. Um, wind velocities, um, I, I can't give you the, the details. I don't know um, the wind velocities. I, I will tell you, though, that um, we've taken lots of really interesting um, uh, still images as well as videos of both dust devils and dust lifting events. And many of them, um, for me, they're very, um, uh, they make me feel like, hey, this, this planet's not that different from Earth. It's like a windy day in the desert. You see the, you know, the, the dust just blowing across the landscape. And so we've landed in a very, um, it's not unusually windy, but there's apparently a lot of dust that is getting lifted by the wind. Um, and so we can just see the, you know, the wind blowing, across, the dust blowing across the landscape. Wow, that's wild. Um, that's awesome. Uh, another question here says, if there were rivers, does that assume there was rain or snow? Uh, the, the presence of rivers, at least if they were held for any substantial length of time, yes, would indicate that there was precipitation of some sort. Um, there are, there are other ways that you could imagine, um, freezing, um, ice. Uh, for example, there are places on the moon that are thought to have ice, um, that accumulates very, very slowly. It's, it's like having a, you know, a freezer. Um, you know, your, your freezer will accumulate ice in it um, over time if you don't defrost it. Um, you could imagine something like that happening. So you, you know, you accumulate ice over long periods of time, and then there's something that causes the planet to heat up all of a sudden. Um, but uh, that's a, that seems like a, a real stretch. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think the, the most plausible interpretation of lakes and rivers is that there was precipitation that fed it at some point. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, Another question here says, was the Ingenuity helicopter only for the purposes of testing flight or has it been outfitted with any instruments as well? 
the helicopter is it, it is a um, it's a very challenging um, device because it, in order to fly, it has to lift its own mass, and there is a big battery in there to make that happen. And this is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have a lot of lift capacity for scientific instruments. This this one doesn't. Um, it has two cameras. It has what's called the navigation camera, which is a simple black and white camera. Um, and it also has a color camera, which produces high resolution images that, that are similar to what you get off of your cell phone. So that, that is effectively a, a scientific instrument, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a low mass version of a science instrument. Yeah, I imagine that could eventually get become more than that in the future. Yeah, yep. <laughs> That'd be the plan. This was the test. Awesome. Um, another question here says, are they using a laser to sample any of the rocks found similar to previous rovers? Yes. Um, like Curiosity, Perseverance has a, a laser um, uh, on the mast, the, the uh, uh, mast that stands up in the middle of the, of the rover to give us a, a view out over the landscape. There's a laser there that, that fires laser pulses at rocks as far away as about 20 feet. And um, this laser is powerful enough that it vaporizes uh, the rock surface when it strikes, strikes it and makes a plasma. So that means you separate the electrons from the nucleus. And then those electrons um, uh, fall back, they, they recombine um, with, the, uh, with the nuclei. And the important point of that is that that happens, when that happens, it emits photons. So photons come out and they have characteristic wavelengths for what element um, was in the plasma. And we, uh, um, we have a spectroscopic instrument that monitors what, what the wavelengths are that are coming back. So yes, we do this. And this is the way that we can very quickly survey the landscape uh, looking for, um, you know, are, is this rock different from that rock? Well, you shoot it with the laser and you look at the chemical composition that comes back from this. This is a technique called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. Wow, that's awesome. Um, another question here says, what do you know about the Chinese rover and its mission? Is there any complementarity between Perseverance or other US rovers and the Chinese rover? Uh, I know very little and I think I'm in good company knowing very little. There is not a lot of um, interaction. Um, it is largely precluded. NASA does not collaborate um, with China on, on space missions. It's just, we just don't do it. Uh, so I don't know very much. Uh, I've seen the pictures, some of the pictures that they have taken, but I don't really know any details. Interesting. Um, another question here says, how do you prevent Martian dust from affecting mechanics of the rover? Yeah, this is a, this is a really good question. The, the dust is everywhere. And if you look at um, pictures, uh, that include the back of the rover. Many of the pictures we take with the mast will include the back of the rover. And the, the back of the rover is a brilliant white, or it was a brilliant white. And now you will see that it's kind of a reddish tint. It is coated with dust. So dust is falling out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that causes a, a few problems. Um, the, uh, the most obvious one is you don't want it to get on your camera lenses or any of your sensitive instruments that have uh, apertures for taking in information. And uh, so lens caps, got uh, everything's got a lens cap. Almost everything has a lens cap. Some things that don't, there's a kind of a clever way to keep the dust from landing where you don't want it. For example, we have calibration targets. These are little pieces of material that have known properties, like a known color um, that you want to calibrate your camera with. You don't want the dust on that, and you don't want to necessarily build a complicated mechanism like a lens cap that can move. Um, it turns out that the dust, a very large fraction of the dust is magnetic. And so you put right next to your little, little target, you put a magnet that, that kind of sucks the dust away from where you don't want it. And then the, the, bigger, the bigger challenge is you've got to keep that dust out of, out of mechanisms. Um, so the mechanisms are sealed against dust so that the dust cannot get into the, you know, to the lubricated surfaces, for example. Yeah, wow, that's, yeah, the dust, that's crazy. Um, I know we are coming up here at the end of the uh, 6.30 mark, so I think we'll end on this great question. Um, it says, what has been the most surprising find on the mission so far? 
Oh, well, I, I'll tell you personally, the biggest surprise was how well that for me was how well the helicopter worked. But I, I don't think that's a uh, that's probably not the way the question was meant. And I just say that because the helicopter, it is was such a challenge for that thing um, to work. And it has mm -hmm. worked incredibly well. From a science point of view, um, it was the discovery of that boulder bed in the Delta, which showed us there was a period of flooding. And I think that one, the, the beauty of that one is uh, you look at that picture and it tells you the story. You don't need sophisticated models. We can all appreciate that any, any river that can move a, a boulder that's a meter across, that is a ripping flood coming in. And so I, I like that just from the point of view of A, it's a surprise, and B, it is so simple. You just look at it and nod your head and say, yep, that must be, that must have happened. So that, was a, that was a big, quick victory for us. Wow, that's awesome. All right, I think uh, being cognizant of everyone's time, I will wrap up here. So thank you everyone for tuning in this evening and thank you, Ken, again, for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, I think this topic was super interesting for our attendees and I think they definitely found it fascinating based on all these questions we had. Uh, our next cafe side will be coming up in October. So be on the lookout for the registration link in our follow-up email. Uh, and with that, I'll let you all go. Have a great rest of your Thursday evening, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, next month. Thanks.